Hi everyone, I'm Mihai and welcome to my 3D printing project. What we see here on the right side is a 3D printer and on the left side there's a tool changer which can host at least 10 hot ends so that you can print with 10 materials at a time without the typical waste. The reason I say at least 10 materials is because this device on the left can be scaled up to host perhaps 20 hot ends. What I want to achieve with this video is to give you some insight into the design decisions that I had to make, which might hopefully help you with your own 3D printing projects. And perhaps you have even better ideas of how I could improve this even further. And I'll wait for your comments for that. To give you an idea where I'm coming from, last year I started working on this similar project, uh, which revolves around my Pistop 2 extruder, which is here. The main idea was to add an accessory to existing 3D printers so that you could convert them and be able to print multicolor prints. What you see here on the right hand side is a heavily modified Prusa Mark 3S printer. Um, originally, the idea was to be able to support other printers and in fact, this extruder that you see here can be mounted on this printer as well as some of the Creality printers. After building a prototype of what you see here and testing it out on a few printers, I quickly realized that what I set out to do was pretty much impossible. The existing printers would either not be able to provide the print quality that I was looking for, or in the case of the Prusa printer, the modifications were so great that it did not make sense to modify an existing printer anymore. So three months ago, I decided to completely scrap this project and build this other one. So what you see here is built from scratch over the last three months. I just finished it a couple of days ago, so I haven't gotten to building it yet, which means that most of what you're seeing here is going to change. The goal of this project is to achieve multi-material printing without almost any waste and with almost no limit to how many colors you could use. I also want it to be very reliable, very user-friendly and achieve better print quality than the best printers I own. Whether or not I'm going to achieve that remains to be seen. The main attraction here is the left-hand side where all the hot ends are parked and you can see here 10 parked hot ends plus a probe that is also designed as a tool. And the way this is designed to work is that we have this arm that can revolve and reach all these parking slots. So whenever the printer requires a particular hot end, it's going to park its extruder here and then this arm will unload the hot end park it in a free space and then load the next one, which is preheated, so that the printer can continue printing with a new color or the new kind of material. And I guess now it's a good time to show you around the extruder and the hot ends. This is one of the tools. In this case, we've got a V6 hot end inside and it is connected with the four wires to a pogo connector and it mounts on the extruder via these three mounting points. This is part of a kinematic mounting system which promises micron precision. And the pogo connector here is rated for 9 amps, so it should be plenty for your most demanding hot end. Let me open it so we can look inside. You can see a V6 hot end here and there's enough room at the top to extend it up in case you want to use a longer hot end like a volcano or a rapido or a rapido ultra high flow hot end or perhaps whatever other hot end you might want to be using no matter what hot end there will be inside the outside dimensions are identical for all of them including the nozzle position i've also included an nfc tag here which can be read from the front you can do that with your phone if you want, but it's mainly there so that the tool changer can read it and you can store useful information for yourself, such as what kind of hot end is inside, what kind of nozzle, uh, what material, what diameter. This can also be used by the tool changer to check that you're actually printing with the material you expect to print with 
and there's no error where you have settings for PLA, for example, but there's actually PTG loaded in this particular hotend. I don't have mountings for other hotends at the moment, but what I can show you here is how the volcano hotend would look like inside. So I'm going to hide the V6 hotend and show the volcano one. So you see how the radiator moves up and then the nozzle stays in the same place. I'm going to overlap them to see the difference. Here's one, here's the other one. All right, I'm going to put the cover back. To achieve multi-material printing right now, there are two main options. One is to use one hotend with one extruder and keep changing the filament that you're printing with. And what you end up with is a mix of the colors, which you don't really want. So the solution there is to have a purge block, which takes well, material and takes a lot of time. Oh, look, my camera froze. Yay! The second option for multi-material printing is to have multiple hotends with their own extruders and the printer itself is designed in such a way that it can either switch between two different hotends and there's a risk there that because they're one next to the other all the time, one of them could start oozing and cause problems with the print. The other solution that we'll be seeing in the Prusa Excel printer and it's been shown before is to have a printer that has multiple extruders parked somewhere in the back and it can go and grab whichever extruder it needs, prints with it, and then puts it back and loads the next one and so on. There are some additional costs there compared to my solution where you only swap the hot ends because they have to swap the entire extruders. Then you have to replicate the whole extruder multiple times and have a 3D printer board that can pretty much run all of them in parallel, although you can, you can always use only one at most. There's also a limit to how many you can physically host, which is usually about five. Maybe you could squeeze a sixth. My idea is to have at least 10 colors ready all the time for whatever print you need to do, uh, ideally 20. And you might think, hey, Mihai, there aren't that many models that use this many colors. Well, we don't have printers to print them with, so why would anyone make them yet? The second one is a usability problem. Even if you only need one or two colors, it might be that sometimes you want a larger nozzle to print a draft. Uh, other times you want a carbon filled material other times you might want a different color uh, for your print. And what this can also help with is that you don't have to go to the printer, unload the color and load a new one or a new material. You can just tell the slicer, hey, I want to print this thing with red and on the next print, I want to print it with carbon filled PTG or whatever. Something else that I want to achieve with my vision is to have a 3D printer that just works and you don't need a lot of skills. Ideally, you order it, you get it pre-assembled, pre-tuned, pre-tested, everything's working perfectly. It comes in a wooden crate, you just plug it in and start printing. It comes with a print made with the printer so that you can see exactly what kind of quality it should be achieving. You don't need to configure it, you don't need to tune it in any way, it comes with ready-made profiles, so you just print, basically. It's what a 3D printer should be doing. What I want to strongly avoid is a 3D printing project that takes forever to align everything, to configure everything. It's still kind of like not working very well, so you have to tune it. One thing that we often see in 3D printer reviews are some average quality prints and the story is always around the, oh, I'm supposed to perhaps tune it more or dial it in or whatever that means. Why hasn't it been dialed in? The way I see 3D printers is mostly like cars. Some people like to modify them and tune them, but most of us, we just want to drive them from one place to another and possibly back. When I buy a car, ideally, I don't have to be the mechanic for the car. And that's the idea behind my project. Beside the 
infinite color printing. Anyways, enough rambling. Let's go through what I have here. Um, perhaps first I should zoom in to the extruder. So this part that you see here is called the extruder, if you didn't know. And it's used to melt the material into the shape you want to build. So this is the extruder. You might be familiar with the design already. Um, it opens like so. And then the gears here release as well. You can imagine the filament is already loaded here. And now you'd be able to pull out the hot end. And the reason it stays there is because there's a system with magnets that keep it in place, even if this latch is open. So now you can take the hot end out and I can't seem to be allowed to do that. Let's just hide it there. So this is the extruder without the hot end. Um, there's a geared motor. Um, how do we see the motor? Let me do a section through here. There you go. You can see this tiny motor here driving this gear, which drives this other gear. Um, because it's small, the whole thing can be more lightweight than my previous design, which had a huge motor. You can see the kinematic mount here. Uh, it's a really cool solution for locking two parts in place in a way that they're always aligned in the same position. You can read more online about it. It's quite cool. And then we've got the pogo connector. So this particular pogo connector, unlike many other pogo connectors, is made by Milmax in the US um, and it can withstand 9 amps. And it's been tested for 1 million mating cycles. So you can imagine that hot ends are being loaded and un unloaded all the time. And for most pogo connectors, there's a limit to how many times you can do this action before they start to degrade and possibly catch on fire. So these ones can do at least 1 million mating cycles, I've been told, which should last you for quite a while. And then it would be pretty easy to replace them. Let me put a hot end back and I'm going to slice it so that we can see inside. An extruder doesn't have that many parts. It's, it has to have some motor that drives some gears that ultimately pull the filament and push it into the hot end. And the hot end here melts the filament at the bottom and then the melted filament comes out through this tiny orifice in the nozzle. And because this part is very hot, we need to keep this other part reasonably cold. Otherwise, the melting zone expands and then you get a jam or you risk melting the rest of the extruder. The way we cool this radiator here is with a fan at the back. Here's the fan. And this fan will push air through here and through the fins of the hot end. So you can see the path this way and coming through. There's going to be still a problem with the printed part right underneath here, which will be very hot and very gummy. So we need a way of cooling it. And the way we cool it is by blowing air through these fins and they, they go all, all around. And the air comes here through this pipe from this delta fan, which is really powerful. They used, they're normally used in servers. I can show you the fan alone. They are just starting to be used in 3D printers. They are quite small at only 40 millimeters, um, but they can produce incredible pressure, which is very important for printing PLA materials if you want to print reasonably fast, I would say. And at the back, we've got a cable room with all the cables that are needed to run everything here. What is also nice to have in a 3D printer are filament sensors. So there are multiple kinds of sensors. Some of them can detect if your filament runs out and they stop printing until you replace it with new filament or whatever so that your print doesn't get ruined. Other sensors are more advanced and they can check for clogs or jams or filament stuck somewhere and they can stop and alert the user. 
Now, this being an early version, I haven't had the time to add any of these sensors here, but there is designated room here to have both of these kinds of sensors. So because I could manually open the extruder and take out this hot end and plug in another one and then close it back, we could also do this automatically during printing. And that's exactly why this tool changer exists. So right now, the two devices, the printer and the tool changer work as independent devices. They have their own brains and their own displays. Um, later on, I might combine them together because the tool changer could not work without this particular printer. And you might reason that, well, the printer is still useful because I can manually swap hot ends. Say the hot end got clogged and I want to quickly swap it so that I can continue printing whatever I want to print, or I want a hot end with a different kind of nozzle, maybe one that works with abrasive materials, or one that can print faster. Um, so you could still use the printer without the tool changer, and the design is made in such a way that even the power supplies are separate for the two. I'm guessing you've seen 3D printers before, so let's look at the tool changer so like i said this arm here which i can barely animate uh, can take a tool unload it into some empty uh, parking position and then load another one and then take it to the printer and it flipped okay and it's got a tiny thingy here and the job of this is to activate this arm. You see it matches this hole and is gonna open and close this latch. So obviously this can move left and right and up and down. It's a bit jerky. Um, it's got here the NFC reader so that it can read information from all the hot ends, even without moving them. There's an accelerometer, which I might use later to detect uh, crashes if something goes wrong and something gets tangled and the arm crashes into something, then we can detect it with this sensor. And for other kinds of crashes, there's going to be a magnet here with a hole sensor uh, and there's sort of like a strain relief system here. So whenever the arm pushes into something and it starts bending, then the whole sensor is going to detect that and alert the system, hey, something's wrong, let's stop and call someone to figure out what's going on. Uh, these are basic safety features that I believe are very important. So that's why I added them already uh, from the first version. And there's a bunch of cables here uh, that go through there and go into here and there's a motor that we power the cables go like so and then like so and then like so well you can imagine them connected and then back to this box uh, where the electronics will be uh, because this is a prototype there's nothing inside really it's just room to place the electronics and make sure there's no short circuit or something it's got its own power supply and a screen and the plan is to have a completely custom firmware written from scratch to be running this whole device. Now, if you remember about hot ends, I was saying that they need to be cooled down on the top side. And because we have so many here, I couldn't have fans for all of them. So we've got this one main fan that pushes air or blows air through a pipe here and through a pipe here, and I guess we can slice into them. There we go. So we can see how air comes out and goes through the these cutouts and to the hot ends. So this way, all of them get cooled down all the time. And one problem with having passive hot ends is that they're gonna cool down to room temperature. And whenever you need to load the next hot end, if it's cold, it might take upwards to 
20, 30 seconds to heat up before the printer can continue printing. And we don't want to spend this time because imagine a print could have thousands, maybe tens of thousands of swaps if, if it's really big and it has a lot of colors and we can have a lot of colors. So I expect this to be the usual case. We want to minimize the time needed to swap hot ends. But at the same time, if we want to preheat them, we cannot preheat all of them because then we would getting back to the problem of being able to control all the hot ends at the same time, which takes pretty much custom hardware, custom electronics. So what I've got here that I've got on this upper row, passive positions and on the bottom row, I've got a mix of passive, of passive parkings with active parkings. So you see these wider ones, they are, all of them are active uh, positions. So whatever hot end is here is going to have a connector and it actually has the connector here. That's just the wires are missing. Um, and for this tree, we can measure the temperature and we can preheat them and get them ready for when the hot end swapping arrives. And for this to work, I have to first parse the G code, which is the file that we use to make a print and look ahead to see when the next uh, tool will be needed, which one it is and how long from now is going to be needed. And we can plan ahead knowing how long it takes to preheat each one of them and pick the one we need, place it in a free uh, active heating bay and start heating it up to get it ready. Now, because of these tubes here, which are kind of necessary um, to be able to have the hot end reach all the points here, as well as all the build volume, we need these extra tubes. And I've got a tensioning system here, which lightly pulls each individual tube. So because there are only a limited number of active bays here where we can preheat hot ends, what the system will have to do is figure out how to juggle with all these hot ends so that the correct ones have a, an empty active location where, can, where they can preheat. There can be a lot of juggling that it has to do, especially because these tubes could tangle and you have to make sure that they're always untangled. So there might be additional intermediary swaps in between the locations. And to be able to achieve that, I've got one free bay. So one bay with, will always be free. And assuming that one of the hot ends is loaded in the printer, then you've got two bays that are always free. And then the tool changer can manage all the positions and move the hot ends around so that the correct bays are free to allow for preheating and to avoid tangling. Now you might have noticed that I said 10 hot ends, but there's actually 11. And the reason is that this is a, this is a probe. And you might have noticed that our extruder doesn't have any probe and is not mandatory to have a probe. Many printers don't have one. And the reason why a probe exists to avoid problems printing the first layer, we want to make sure that we know exactly where to position this first layer. And for that, we need a probe. So the probe goes around the bed and measures various points to figure out where it is. The reason this extruder doesn't have a probe is because the probe usually sticks out. Even if it's a retractable probe, it's going to be very close to where the print is. And I want to avoid this. There are other solutions with uh, probes that attach with a magnet to the extruder. Uh, you use them to probe and then they detach and get parked somewhere. But since I have a tool changer, I thought, why not? convert one of the tools into a probe. So the way it will work is that the hot end gets unloaded and then the probe gets loaded here and then it does the meshing and then off we go with the printing. Now you'll say, why do we care about a probe sticking down? And you might have noticed this 
weird rounded shape at the bottom for my extruder. And the reason is that I look forward to non-planar 3D printing. So you might know that a print, a 3D printer prints everything in horizontal layers, one on top of the other, and this might produce weird patterns on top of the shapes where they're almost horizontal, but not quite. So instead of getting a smooth surface, you get sort of a stairway or a staircase. And this is one problem that non-planar 3D printing aims to solve. And for that, it has to be able to reach down into the valleys of the print without crashing into like the parts that are already taller. Uh, and this way it can follow the contour of the print very smoothly without any staircase. My extruder allows for a 20% incline or about 11 degrees for the top surface of the print that you want to have smoothed out. Now, in order to achieve this, we also need a slicer that knows how to use non-planar printing. Um, and this feature is barely supported, almost, but I'm hoping that in the future we're going to see more support for that and we're going to be able to use it with this extruder. And it's something that I'm really excited about, although I'm not sure when we're going to get to see that. Anyways, back to the tool changer. Have I missed anything? No, I don't think so. Well, we've got the power supply here. I think I'm, I mentioned it. Um, we're going to have the spool somewhere here at the back. So I haven't mentioned this yet. Uh, should be quite obvious. It will go through its own tube to the hot end. And there is an amount of friction that we're going to have inside the tube. So what we want to have is the shortest tube required. And we should have the spools as close to the tip of the tube as possible, if that makes sense. So these are PTFE tubes. They are usually used in 3D printers. You find them in most hot ends as a tiny bit, and you find them in uh, Bowden printers where, where we've got a remote extruder. Now we don't have a remote extruder. So what this is called is reverse Bowden. And one thing that I noticed by, by testing this kind of system is that, that there tends to be a lot of friction in the tubes, especially if there's friction at the spool, that friction gets amplified where when we take the filament through the tube. And this is particularly true for filaments that don't easily slide or are more rigid and they keep pushing against the walls of the tube. So one solution is to have somewhat wider tubes on the inside. And normally we have um, two millimeter wide tubes and those are not great for this situation. I've tried three millimeter tubes and those are wide enough, but the walls are very, very um, thin and they can easily kink. And then now I've got another shipment of 2.5 millimeter tubes and those look very promising, so I'll be testing those. So that's pretty much it with the tool changer. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. And now I'm going to quickly go through the printer design. Um, this started as a basically heavily inspired Prusa Mark 3S with a bare frame, which got really modified. The point was to get a printer as fast as, as fast as possible so that I can test it. But I decided to go with linear rails on all the axes, well, all the X, Y, Z axis, axis. And you might ask, well, why, why do I need a custom printer? Uh, because if you could mount the extruder on a printer, then everything should work. But actually it wouldn't because beside this extrusion and the rail, you need a wider room here at the back for the extruder to be able to move left and right enough distance, All right? And typically what happens with 3D printers is that they, it's easy to get something that looks like a 3D printer, but prints like crap. Um, whereas getting it to print perfectly 
is a completely different problem. And if I want to have a printer that prints pretty much perfectly, then I need to be able to control all the small details. Now, what you might not know about me is that I'm a software developer. I'm not a mechanical engineer. So most of the things I have to test and figure out and try to understand. So I designed this printer more like a playground where I can quickly swap parts in and out. And you might have noticed that everything here is easy to replace everywhere. It's all 2020 extrusion and 2040 extrusion, which is very easy to find and cut. Everything is off the shelf, all the connectors, screws, linear rails, power supplies, everything that is not off the shelf is 3D printed. So this way, pretty much anything can be changed whenever the need comes. The extruder we've discussed already, the way it gets connected to the printer is through this cable loom that goes in here. And one thing you notice is that this electronics box is huge. And the reason it's huge, and I'm gonna pop out the lid. By the way, the lid has no screws. Um, and then inside, there's there are these cable organ organizing thingies. I don't know what the name is. Um, and there's a lot of room here. And I made sure there's enough room to be able to fit any existing 3D printer board, at least the typical commercial ones. All of them can fit in here. And this little, this little backboard can be replaced depending on what kind of layout you want and wh where you want the screws to be positioned. And same here at the bottom, you might want to include a Raspberry Pi or Banana Pi or whatever, Apple Pi, whatever you eat, potentially together with a buck converter, if you need uh, more power for the 5 volt rail or the 12 volt rail for the fan here. So you would be able to have all those here. And this is quite easy to configure. So I've got a panel here and this is an example of how a panel would look like for a large board and the buck converter here. And you're not limited to only to only one board, you can even stack them. I don't know why you would stack them, but that's possible. And I wanna show you something really cool. There's a nice add-on for Fusion called Sheeter, which connects the project to a spreadsheet. And I've got a spreadsheet here with all the dimensions for whatever layout I want. For example, I might want an SKR2 board or a Robin Nano with a buck converter or an octopus board or a, a duet board or whatever you might want. And the way it works in Fusion, I can go and change the layout that I want. For example, I don't want this duet board layout. I want the octopus layout and here it is. Or perhaps I want to make a board for Raspberry Pi with a bug converter, or I might want a Pi Zero with nothing around it. So it's really easy to generate these new boards and you can then simply mount into the existing slots. I'm also playing around with this clamping system here for um, cable looms. Let me find the project. Okay, here we go. So you'd have to imagine this part moving in and out depending on the diameter of whatever cable is in here. So this is one half and there's a matching half and they combine. There's a similar clamping mechanism here to power the uh, heated bed. Now, one thing special about this printer is that it's got a probe here. It's a nozzle probe. And if you're familiar with the Push Excel printer, the idea is somewhat similar that we use a nozzle probe to measure the height of all the nozzles from all the hot ends. So the way it would work is the tool changer would, would tell to the printer, hey, take this hot end, go and probe it on the probe, and let's see 
what's the position of the tip of the nozzle. So you don't only probe it from the top, but also from the side, so that we know that, for example, one nozzle is shorter and another one is a little bit more to the left and another one is a little bit more to the front. So the whole procedure would be that we tell the tool changer, hey, go figure out all the nozzle offsets and it's gonna it's gonna load into the printer each hot end individually, measure it, write the offset into the NFC tag, and and then later during printing, whenever a hot end is loaded, we also read the nozzle offset and apply it so that the print comes out perfectly with no misalignments between the colors. Now, because I designed this with the idea that I might try out perhaps wider belts or double offsetted belts or whatever else could be the new rage, who knows what that would be. There is enough room here to add wider belts and th this is even configured in the project. One fun thing to show you is that there's a project parameters file and in there I've got things like the printer dimensions, the tool changer dimensions, uh, the distance between the parking positions and all sorts of other settings, including the size of the of the belts for the X axis, for the y, the y axis. So it's only a matter of adding a nine here and then ta-da, we have a nine millimeter belt uh, solution. Now, this might not be completely foolproof. So in some cases, I might have to go and check if something went wrong during the change. But I find this an incredibly useful feature for trying out different builds. So my approach in general is to try out different parts, measure what, what there is to measure, and then draw conclusions instead of looking at something that doesn't look great and try to come up with some explanations that may or may not be correct. One small change I had to do uh, versus all the other printers pretty much was to move this motor to the right side and the reason is that there's not enough room on the left side. If you look at the tool changer, it it barely clears the space um, in, in between the two devices. So there, there would be no room for the motor there. I'm using lead screws for the Z-axis. It's quite a popular choice. Um, one problem with these screws is that if they're not perfectly aligned, then you might get problems like uh, Z-wobble. It's quite difficult to align, especially when the printer is built with uh, parts that are 3D printed. So 3D printed parts almost never come out to the correct size and they could be not just the wrong size, but also slightly bent or slightly skewed. And no matter how well you adjust the printer, you might still have problems. So misalignments from that uh, for the Z motors are a, a huge problem in 3D printing. So what I try to do here is to have a system where I can tighten or loosen this screw here. Oops. The, well, there's a screw here and there's a screw on the other side. Um, and the printed part has a cutout here at the middle, which allows for slight corrections of the part by tightening the screws. Um, and from them, I can control the vertical position of the lid screw uh, with a very good precision. And I can control this even before installing anything on it. When I work on my projects, I tend to iterate a lot, which means that I often have to swap parts in and out uh, with newer versions. And one thing I focused on for this design was to make it very easy to replace parts without having to un disassemble half the printer. For example, the entire X axis is very easy to take out and disassemble with just a couple screws. Same for, same for the bed system. By the way, for the bed, you see how it runs on linear rails. 
but you could as well run it on rods if you wanted to. I don't believe I would be using this, but it was so easy to do that I did it. So it's it's a quick change that doesn't affect the rest of the printer. Now for the power, I've got a dual power supply unit here. And the main reason when I design these things is I'm thinking, hey, what if I want 24 volts, but I also want to play around with those high voltage drivers, uh, which require say 48 volts. And then I want to have two power supplies, uh, which occupy more space. So my approach is to make the, the biggest option possible. And then I can always shrink it down. Maybe only have one power supply or have a wider power supply instead of two uh, th uh, slimmer ones. And underneath there's the IC socket. Now, one interesting thing with this unit, and let me show you in the other project. If you look back at these connectors, you will see there are seven plugs. Let me hide the... there. So there are seven plugs here, and most of them have only six or well, sometimes there are only three because you don't see some of them because they're in they're, they're undercover. But these ones are the only ones that cut power from both wires. So most printers have a switch here that only operates on one of the wires. So you you might think that you're turning off the printer and then there's no more power in the printer, but there is actually still power potentially coming from one of the wires from the power outlet. Now that's not necessarily a problem because this power goes directly into the into the uh, power supply unit, which converts it to uh, DC power. And if only one wire is powered, then in theory, there would be no output power. So you shouldn't get electrocuted in theory, but it depends on the power supply. And because I'm obsessed about safety, I prefer to have these special uh, ones that interrupt power on both uh, wires from the outlet. Now, either way, whenever you work on a printer, always physically unplug it, no matter the switch, because these switches, they can sometimes mal malfunction. And you might think it's turned off when in fact there's still power. So always, always unplug the printer whenever you have to work on it. And I've got a fancy mushroom button here. It works as a panic button. So if you panic, you press the button and it works very similar to this switch, only it's, it's easier to access and to punch. Um, and it cuts off power throughout the printer. So when you, for example, put your nose in here and then it gets caught in, in between the moving parts, you can quickly punch this button. And this is a, this is a button that locks, uh, locks down when you press it. So it keeps the power cut off until you rotate it and then it, it comes back on. And I think this is a nice safety feature. So I, I added it already. And this concludes our tour for the Pistop 3 project. I'll be assembling this whole thing over the next weeks. Um, the plan is to first test the, the, the printer alone, uh, tweak it, try out different boards, different firmers. I want to try out uh, Marlin uh, RepRap firmer because I've got the board and the fancy big seven inch panel um, and also try out a clipper because there's and there's there's room here to have the raspberry pi or banana pie apple pie whatever pie i think it would be really cool to see comparison prints with each one of them tuned very well um, in the future ideally i would have my own custom 3d printer firmware but that's quite a daunting task so i want to intentionally leave it for later We've got pretty good firmware already. 
uh, that can be used. However, for the tool changer, because it's such a custom thing, I want to write my own firmware. I will have to figure out how to communicate with the rest of the 3D printing stack, the firmware, the file manager, whether you want to use an SD card or use Octoprint or whatever else interface you're used to using, figure out how the tool changer could send G-code commands to the printer, for example, to probe, probe, probe uh, hot end, but also during normal printing to know when it's supposed to swap hot ends in and out. So there are a lot of problems that I'm not sure exactly how I'm gonna be solving, but I have some idea I have almost zero experience with embedded systems, so this will be quite a challenge, but I've been working as a software engineer since 2003, so I'm hoping that a lot of what I learned during all these years will help me go reasonably fast with having a custom firmware. One life strategy, if you will, that I have is to try and get better at what I what I do and that how well I do it and improve my skills all the time. Writing this firmware, for example, is the first step into learning how to control hardware directly, like with no libraries, no existing firmwares that may or may not do exactly what I want. I have some ideas, for example, how to avoid VFA patterns that show up in, in, in many prints, if not most prints. Um, but for that, it's really hard, or at least I find it really hard to try to modify existing firmware, which is perhaps not designed for particularly what I want to do. And in situations like that, for me, it's almost always better to start from scratch and not use any libraries. And then I'm, I'm forced to understand everything that happens. There's no assumptions. And then it's very easy for me to iterate and there's no limit imposed by whatever firmware I'm using. So that's a, that's a longer term plan that is going to extend to the next year. Um, for this year, I'm hoping to get what we see on the screen working uh, reasonably well, have some acceptable level of integration with slicers um, and get awesome prints from it. So that's all I have for now. I hope that you're as enthusiastic as I am uh, about this project. If you have any questions or suggestions, or you want to talk about your own 3D printing project, feel free to leave some comments down below. As you might be able to tell, I'm very, very passionate about this project. I'm working on it full time. Thank you to all my awesome Patreon supporters who are making it easier for me to work on this project of mine. If you love it and have the possibility to support my work, you're welcome to join my Patreon page. I try to post updates there more often and from time to time, including this Sunday, we host live Zoom sessions where we meet and discuss about the projects. Don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and till next time, stay awesome!